welcome to episode number 69 of My Week at the Club. Uh, this week I have a very exciting game, I think, uh, against Larry Gladding. Um, but before I dive into that game, I'd like to um, do my little astronomy corner. And I was thinking about talking about neutron stars and some of their funny properties, how you know, time slows down on their surface. They, they have a, a, a whole host of properties. But that particular idea about time slowing down, I realized um, maybe deserves a little discussion on its own. So I wanted to talk about that this week. Why, why, do, why does time appear to slow down on the surface of massive bodies? Or actually, um, you know, an, any body at all that has a gravitational field, uh, including the surface of the Earth or even, even smaller bodies. And to understand it, um, I mean, it, it's, it's often thought of as a uh, result of general relativity, but you don't really need Einstein's general relativity to understand what's happening. Um, it comes out as something simpler, um, not, not trivial, but it's quite a bit simpler, uh, called gravitational redshift. And the gravitational redshift is a phenomenon that if you, oh, I mean, if you stand on the surface of the Earth and go out at night with your uh, green laser pointer and shine it up, make, making sure you don't uh, point it at any airplanes or you'll get in a lot of trouble, uh, shine it up into the sky, that green laser pointer, uh, you know, the, the color green has a particular frequency associated with it. And as it goes up, that frequency actually will um, get a bit smaller, um, get lower, and at the same time the wavelength will increase and the color will change. Now probably not perceptibly to us, it'll be very small, but if we lived on a neutron star or something you'd actually see a change in the color. Um, and what's happening is that light, um, the photons, the, the uh, um, wavelength and uh, frequency are, are dependent on how much energy a photon has. So really highly energetic, um, very high frequency photons like you have uh, oh, in an X-ray or gamma rays um, are very energetic. And as you know, because they can cause cancer, they can damage DNA, things like that. Each photon packs a real wallop and that's because they're at such a high frequency and the amount of energy is just proportional to that frequency. Um, and if you somehow decrease the energy of that uh, photon, then its um, frequency will go down and its wavelength will get longer. And that's what happens, because going climbing up out of the gravity well of the Earth, or away from the sun, say, away from any star, um, takes energy for the photon to uh, try to escape that gravity field. And as it does so, the, it gets stretched out. The uh, wavelength gets longer. So how is this related to time passing? Well, um, you know, the kind of glib answer would be that, well, the way we uh, measure time accurately is uh, with a cesium clock, which is based on vib a certain number of vibrations of a particular uh, atom and the, the wavelength of the light that's emitted. But that doesn't really tell you very much about how time is related to the uh, wavelengths. Um, so instead what I, I thought about was kind of a simple little thought experiment where if you, if you took a metronome and you know set it to click, 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 click once per second back and forth and you took your laser and shined the laser on the uh, metronome as it's going back and forth, you could at least in theory count how many cycles of the laser light um, uh, how many times it uh, varies um, during the course of one second as it goes across. You see it, you know, the cycles going up and down and up and down and up and down. You, not with your eyes, you can't do that, but there are instruments, you can trust me on this, that can measure the, uh, the uh, change in the uh, phase of that wave, of the, the cycles. And you could count that, and it might be a billion, it's actually going to be a much larger number, but let's that's an easy number to, to say, so uh, let's, for argument's sake, say it takes a billion cycles to go across as it ticks one second. Well, if you look at that metronome, uh, you know, ticking away back and forth through really good binoculars uh, from up in space, but it's down on the surface of the Earth, um, you should still see, uh, as, it, as it goes across for that one second arc, you should still see that same number of um, waves of light that are coming out from it. 
okay? Because the same, you know, you're just looking at the same phenomenon, but from farther away. But by the time the light gets to you, it's been stretched out in wavelength and decreased in frequency. You don't get as many cycles happening in every second. So it's going to take, for a billion cycles, it's going to take longer than a second to actually see those billion cycles pass by. And so that's actually saying that, gee, it's actually going to take longer than a second, from your point of view, um, for that uh, metronome to go from one side of its arc to the other side. Now, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but uh, hopefully it made a little bit of sense. It's a, it's a pretty small effect I mean, for the, on the Earth. It's um, uh, something a little less than a nanosecond per second that time is slowed down by. Um, now, you know, atomic clocks, you know, computers uh, deal in nanoseconds all the time, or picoseconds, which are even shorter. And um, you can have an atomic clock um, flying around in an airplane and one on the ground, and you can actually see the difference in the time that they keep when they compare one to the other. Um, but it's, it's not anything terribly noticeable. Um, coming from the surface of the sun, it's, um, oh, it's something on the order of a, uh, I calculated it, let me, let me look and see what it was. It was uh, like two microseconds per second that the clock would be running slow by. And you can see that the um, spectral lines coming from the sun are shifted in frequency a little bit due to, the, uh, due to this um, gravitational redshift and the fact that time appears to be running a little more slowly by about two microseconds per second. But if you get to a neutron star, um, it's actually running slowly by on the order of 20 or 30 percent. And so there's a really significant uh, difference between how fast time runs on the surface of a neutron star and for the observer that's farther that's not on the surface of a neutron star. If you were down on the star, of course, besides the fact that you got squashed, time would run, see, appear to run at the, uh, the uh, correct rate. And finally, the most extreme case is a black hole, and at the very surface of the black hole, at the event horizon, time appears to stop. It's, it's redshifted to infinity. And that's, um, that was the origin for the original ideas of black holes when they were first thought of back in the 30s and 40s, they called them frozen stars. Because as something drops into, if you drop the clock into uh, a black hole, you'd see it slowing down as it got closer and closer into it. And then it gets to a point right at the uh, um, event horizon where time actually stops and, and the clock doesn't appear to move anymore from, from our point of view out at a distance. And that's because those wave crests have been stretched out more and more and more until they get to infinity. And so that metronome never uh, looks like it's moving anymore. And that's why they were called frozen stars. Frozen in time. Anyhow, on with the chess. Well, as promised or threatened a bit earlier, I had a, uh, an exciting game with Larry last night that I'd like to share with you in the uh, smith Moore Gambit. And it started out in a you know, pretty standard way. Uh, we're playing on, on board one, I should say, um, second round of the tournament. I had white, Larry had black, and um, the opening moves uh, were very typical of the smith Moore. I've, I've played it a couple of other times on this channel, so uh, you could look back at those games um, if you want to compare what happened. Um, after he takes on d4, I offer the pawn, and he accepted it. And the standard uh, main line here is being followed by both of us. Um, this e6 here is a, a good solid continuation because it, it stops my uh, bishop motion along this diagonal here. Um, my castle, he attacks my pawn. I vacate the d1 square because my rook is headed there. It also um, has couple of uh, other nice properties because it defends his bishop on c4 and also defends the pawn on e4. So it's a, a nice square for the queen. The only bad thing is it can get attacked from d4, but that rarely happens if you're careful. And this was the point that um, the game started to get a little new to me. Um, there are a number of lines in the smith Mora where black plays a6, and it turns out that Look in the database, about a quarter of the games continued this way, but uh, it, it just wasn't um, familiar to me, I guess. Um, it, it's a reasonable move. It 
exerts control influence over this important b5 square to keep my knight from going there at some point um, possibly at some point in the future black could be playing b7 b5 so overall it makes sense it just seemed to me to be sort of slow because it's the king is uh, left in the center here um, and you know might be might become a target so I expected him either to develop the bishop or the queen to c7 um, I continued on with a, you know, the, you could uh, sort of play most of these uh, opening moves for white on autopilot because they're, they really are the, um, the best moves and there's, there's not much else that you, you would consider doing. Um, this was an interesting uh, plan on Larry's part. I, I think the idea behind it is that he wants to um, dominate this e5 square um, and also get his knight away from where it might be uh, might have been attacked by my pawn advancing at some point. Um, so you know it's a good idea, but the problem is is that it, it weakens uh, d6. He only has one defender on it, and by my move, bishop to f4, I can put a second attack on it, and he has to do something about it. It's a kind of a forcing line for me. Um, usually in that position. Uh, Black would play queen to c7 and uh, defend this a second time, but I, you know, that's that that would be an ugly move to make because um, after 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 bishop to f4, because then you know playing queen to c7 would just uh, put the queen in the line of fire, even though it does defend the pawn a second time. So Larry didn't do that. Um, I thought he might play e5. At least that seemed like a possibility. Um, but the more I looked at it as I was, you know, waiting for a move, um, I realized that, you know, this really probably isn't too good. So my, my first impulse would have been to play bishop g5 or possibly the bishop back to e3. But as I looked at it some more, I realized that knight g5 um, would be quite a strong continuation. Even though my bishop is under attack, this f7 point is, um, can't be defended. Basically, he could defend it with his queen, but his queen is too valuable with uh, me attacking it with minor pieces. And the best line that he would have would be just to go ahead and put his knight on a more um, defensive square, defensively minded square. And white could go ahead and take the pawn. And this is now getting into stockfish territory as far as a continuation. Um, but you know, it's it's you can see the kinds of difficulties that uh, that that Black gets into if, if he were to allow me to gang up on F7, and I, I very well might have gone down a line something like this. He didn't do that though. So instead, after Bishop to F4, attacking the the pawn a second time, he moved his knight, which defends it. So I sort of suspected that this might be the answer, and. Um, so I was ready with uh, bishop to b3. I wanted to keep my bishop along that diagonal. And what I thought might happen here, uh, he didn't do at all, but I thought maybe what he would do would be to play immediately knight to h5, attacking my bishop. My bishop, if I want to keep hold on to it, would have to retreat. And then he could play that knight into c4, um, attacking my, my b pawn here. Um, but I figured a uh, reasonable answer at that point would just be to be uh, play bishop to d3. I suppose I should go ahead and check here with the engine, to see if these are really sensible moves. Uh, of course, it 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 doesn't even want to bother to retreat the bishop, but uh, that's not not horribly wrong. And it says that's white white's maintaining a uh, moderate advantage here. So I I would have. Um, been happy with his position, and then the rook comes over to c1. That did not happen after bishop to b3. Instead, he played his uh, black bishop to e7, which is a reasonable move trying to uh, develop, but the problem is I had a tactical shot, which I played, um, which is to take his pawn on d6, even though it's defended twice. And uh, it's maybe not the absolute best move, um, with you know, with best play, actually, Black can get slight advantage out of this. But in the game, it worked out well. He takes. He kind of has to take, otherwise, it's good for me. And the idea here now is that that bishop is pinned to his queen, right? And uh, by my rook. And so I can 
attack it with my pawn. And what he did here was just a castle. Um, I didn't expect that. Um, I was happy to see it um, because that allows me to hold on to my pawn. Instead, he could have won the, uh, that pawn back and, and stayed a pawn ahead, um, you know, the original gambit pawn in Smith Moore Gambit, by playing knight takes e5. Now I can take the knight, um, and he can't take it back with the bishop, but at this point he could attack it a second time. And what I was thinking about, although we never got to this point, so I'm not sure I would have played this move, was just to drop back with my knight to f3, and that would get my knight out of harm's way, and also at the same time defend the square on h2 that's getting attacked twice now with his queen and bishop. Of course, that's not what Stockfish wanted. Um, what Stockfish would want after this queen c7 move would be rook to c1, um, sacking the knight. <laughs> but the thing is, it, it opens up tactics that uh, are actually quite good for white. Uh, the queen's under attack. If it moves, then one of his pieces will drop. Actually, the, uh, the best line, according to Stockfish, is to go ahead and sack that bishop rather than just let it drop. The king moves, and then he uh, sacks the Stockfish, sacks the queen, <laughs> uh, rather than you know, move the queen away and give up the knight here. So like if he played queen to e7, uh, white could simply have played knight takes knight, something like that. And there's no place for the queen to go where it can continue to defend that knight on, uh, on b6. So, I mean, it's a good line, but I doubt that I would have actually uh, headed down this path. So instead, after e5, instead of taking the pawn with the knight, what Larry did was to uh, castle, possibly thinking I would take back with the pawn. I'm not sure, um, but I felt that the pawn would be overexposed and weak on d6 rather than strength. Um, whereas if I take with the rook, you know, that wins a tempo on, on his queen. It has to move and just furthers my attack. The queen moved, and then I'm able to double rooks here. Um, and now I, you know, I was quite happy with this position. I've, as often happens in the uh, Smith Moore, you get a huge lead in development as white for the cost of a pawn. And you know, over the board and I, in a fairly short time control like we have, it's it's just not that easy to uh, to meet something like that. So after rook to d1, uh, Larry developed his bishop. Um, that's was not the best move, um, but it's not, not, a, uh, not a horrible move either. Um, I, I played knight to e4, bringing another piece into the attack. The knight, while it's back here on c3, it's um, natural entry squares that you know, it would attack the queen by are, are both controlled by pawns. And, but now that I go to e4, all of a sudden this knight is supporting this rook and also threatening to come into f6. Um, I should say that when I was uh, considering this move that what I had to um, think about was the fact that my rook is likely to get trapped here because Larry could move his knight um, at some point in front of uh, in front of this you know supported by the pawn, uh, cutting off the rook from the defense of the other rook, and it also has the possibility of knight takes pawn, knight takes knight, uh, queen takes rook, or something like that. Or he could come back and attack uh, the rook with a, the with a knight. So um, that's part of the consideration when I went to e4 with the knight, is that it also not only threatens f6, but it, it supports that rook on uh, e6. And at worst, I, if that rook is trapped, I could capture back with the knight and have a very dominant knight stuck on d6 for the exchange. Okay, well he continued with uh, move, moving his knight to e7. I felt that was, you know, continuing along this line of uh, wanting to plunk a knight down on d5 and cutting off the support of my rook. Um, and at this point, I seriously considered withdrawing my rook, um, and I think that would have been a mistake if I play my rook back to d3, which would be in some ways the nicest square because then on d3 it has access over to the king side once this knight moves. 
um, that that's not too good because he can uh, immediately skewer my rook and queen with his bishop. I would, wouldn't want to do that. So that would be a mistake. So I, what I, if I were retreating the rook, I think I probably um, would have to have, uh, or most likely, uh, come back to d2. I should also say, uh, going back to um, going back to d4, is you immediately get hit by the knight. So that 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 wasn't very attractive. So if I had gone back to d2 um, with the idea maybe of playing rook to c2 at some point in the future, um, that's good. But I, I, I you know, I felt like. Um, I was in, in reverse because this bishop could still attack my queen, and now if my queen went to where the square it wanted to go to, which would be uh, coming up so that it would still have access to the king side, then the knight could come in and fork my queen and rook, and I'd be forced to trade that knight off. And you know, I, black is starting to get active peace play here. I, and I didn't like that idea, so instead of retreating the rook, I played this aggressive knight move. Um, with the realization that, uh, you know, depending on how the next few moves play out, I might end up having to sacrifice the exchange, uh, trade my rook on d6 for one of his knights, but or for his bishop. That would have been okay with me. However, I realized uh, only when I looked at it with um, Stockfish afterward that I missed a simple tactic here, a uh, very obvious tactic really, which is simply just to take the knight with my rook. And uh, because his queen was overworked, it's defending the bishop and the knight. The knight was helping to defend the bishop, but if I trade my rook for the knight, when the queen takes back, the rook takes bishop, now I've gotten two pieces for the rook, and um, I'll, you know I still have attacking chances. This is quite good for, uh, good for white. Um, I do have to, you know, worry about mate threats, that's why you play h4 in this position. But this actually would be quite a good position. I would have been happy to do this. I couldn't, couldn't afford to take that knight, or I would have gotten checkmated on c1. Um, so I, I didn't see that. Instead, I played knight, knight f to g5, huh, which worked out well, actually, in the game, but it wasn't the, wasn't the strongest continuation. Larry went ahead and shut off my knight, and now I very much wanted to play knight takes h7. Um, Another potential uh, pseudo sacrifice here, but um, I had to decide whether or not to trade off my bishop for the knight on d5 first. And of course, I, I calculated it wrong. Um, it turns out trading it off is about plus four, whereas if I leave it where it is, it's about plus eight in White's favor, uh, machine eval. But you know, I, I didn't see it that way. I, it looked to me like this knight that's on e7 might actually uh, be a, a defensive piece on either g6 or f5. Um, also, um, I, I um, didn't want the knight, you know, in, in the event that my, after um, the, uh, the sacrifice and the check that you'll see upcoming, my queen is going to end up on, uh, in some lines on h8, and with this king moving over away from you know, I'll check on h7 as king moves over, I go to h8 check, the king moves over again, and I didn't want the knight going into g8 to uh, block the check. So that was another reason I, uh, I took here on d5. But the problem is, after e takes d5, um, attacking my knight, uh, it's much of my advantage is gone. Um, he didn't do that, though. He actually played knight takes. And in that, in that case, I still have a pretty strong advantage. Like I said, it's about plus four. And I just played knight takes h7 um, with the thought, really, of after king takes, of coming out with the queen check and then playing knight to g5. Um, it turns out that's not the uh, strongest continuation. Um, and the reason is, I guess I can show it here, uh, is that after he takes, if I came out with the queen check, and he goes back to h8, knight to g5, threatening checkmate, um, he could just simply um, play queen to c2, guarding that checkmate square. So I didn't actually th see that this was possible. Um, also, uh, you know, he's got a, an eye on my rook, although it's currently defended by my queen. 
Um, I don't know if I would have seen it or not. Um, the you know best move it would be to uh, to go with the other other move order, which would have been to check with my knight first, which looks like it's not much different. I, I, I you know I would have tended not to do that because of the uh, idea that he might play king to g6, and then I have to work out the complications of what what comes you know after king to g6 and. Um, my queen either checks them for me for or comes to g4 with a discover, possible discovered check, you know, one of those moves. Um, so that, that's why I would have led with the queen probably, but if, if I check with the knight and, and he instead goes back to uh, g8, which is his best move, then white's best move here is not actually to play queen h5, but it's to play queen e4 and attack along the diagonal. The difference being that now I'm actually um, also guarding this. You know, I've, I've taken over that whole diagonal. I'm also have controlling the c2 square, and now his queen can't come to c2 to stop the uh, the mate on h7. So he's forced to do to to do something else, like to play the pawn up, which um, really weakens his position here. And uh, you know, once the pawn comes up, then my queen can come over to h4 and threaten threaten to. Uh, Threaten to come in on h7, um, or you know he can um, run away by moving his rook and then starting to run with his king, but uh, that doesn't work out well either. So that's not um, that would have been a uh, difficult position for him. I mean, I, I you know. I, I, I could show a little bit more of what would happen there, I guess. Okay, the rook would have gone to e8. I could check. The king comes to f8. And now, you know, it's tempting to come down and uh, h8 and check, but and then take the pawn. But this is not the strongest continuation. He can, uh, he can defend with his rook. It's actually stronger in this position to come back and threaten mate with the queen, uh, threaten the f7 square immediately. And to prevent that, he plays g, g6, and then I come in with check. And the difference being that now, um, now he's weakened these squares yet further around his king. And I can't quite come here yet, and my queen is under attack, so I have to have a discover, you know, threaten a discovered attack, and the rook comes over and attacks me, and I do a discovered attack like with my knight, and he comes back to e8. And it's this is all very bad if you look at it with an engine, but it's um, it would have taken a few moves to try to find a mate in this position. Um, you know, White's threatening to take off, play rook takes knight, and which is the defend the defender keeping my knight and queen from you know, using this f6 square. So I don't know. It would have been um, would have been an interesting position. Uh, if he had continued on, but I guess he had had enough of that. So that was the game. It was fun. It was ended up being, uh, because of the uh, possibly early resignation there, it ended up being a miniature at 19 moves, but uh, it was um, made for a little quicker video this week. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this is Roger Capella from My Week at the Club. See you next week. Bye-bye.